All right, guys, today we're going to talk about the future of survival knives. And most importantly, we're going to talk about half face blades. Are these the future to survival knives? Is this the face of the future? This is kind of the ultimate question. Now, before we get into this, I just want to say a quick thank you. Even though this may not be the most favorable uh, review of fa half face blades, just as a little teaser, I do want to say thank you to the awesome guy. He knows who he is who sent in his own three half ace blades for testing review thoughts and videos as a whole and while i'm going to have more thorough testing and reviews coming in on these guys once it actually warms up I thought I would do a video really breaking down some of the differences between half face blades and some of my more go-to or beloved survival knives. Breaking them down, really taking an in-depth look at these to kind of explain ultimately why I don't think half face blades are all that they cracked up to be. That being said, I do want to also quickly throw out there that if you guys have any knives that you would like to see featured on the channel, I get tons of questions and comments saying, Test this knife, test that knife. If you guys have those knives to send in to test and review, I would definitely appreciate that. As you guys can probably tell, there are so many knives out there. I just do not have the financial or even realistic ability to get every knife myself to independently test. So if you want to send them in, just leave a comment in the comment section below and I will try to facilitate something. So anyways, guys, so before we get into this as well, I also I want to note that when it comes down to half face blades i don't think that these knives are entirely bad if you own a half face blade or multiple of them and moreover if you enjoy the style and the design of these blades don't stop buying them i suppose however like i said i wanted to do this video really breaking down why i personally don't love them and moreover now that i have some examples here um really putting them like head to head versus some of the knives that I really do love. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. All right, so like I said, we have a whole lot of survival knives here and some of my favorite top survival and bushcrafting knives. We have the Chris Reeve Knives Pacific, the Falkneven A1. Then we have, of course, a couple Bark Rivers representing the Bravo one. And also my favorite and probably my all-time favorite wilderness blade right here is the Bark River Knives Bushcrafter in CPM 3V. And of course, lastly, goes without mentioning the good old SE6. And ultimately, I think that these four knives from three different or I should say these five knives from different four different manufacturers really kind of make up what I would consider the peak of the peak of survival and wilderness blades now undoubtedly there are knives that you know are more affordable and more budget oriented things like the SE that really do I think hold their weight and certainly I think one of the most common um, statements I get of why people don't like the half face blades is that for the price point there are knives that perform just as well as they do even in some sometimes some similar um, like materials like micarta and S35 VN or CPM3 and they come in at more affordable price points and largely I do think that this is one of the biggest disadvantages to half face blades they command a very high premium and I think the biggest thing that concerns me about them is that while the build quality on all of the half face blades I've encountered and owned myself is not bad there's something that just is lacking there I can't always quite put my finger on it but I think that largely it's summarized by refinement and what I mean by refinement and ultimately why I wanted to break out these HFB blades and really put them up against blades in similar price categories and sometimes lesser price categories is to really show you that for the price point of what you're spending on these knives I do, I'm not entirely convinced that they are actually fully not necessarily that they're not worth what you're paying, but that you could be getting a superior product elsewhere. And that's kind of my biggest thing. And now, I will say this. 
each one of their blades and this is their junior demo i believe it is if i remember correctly um definitely correct me if i'm wrong but this is um more of their like robust blade this guy is in cpm 3v and would honestly be very comparable to something like this bushcrafter now as you'll probably notice without a doubt that uh all of these HFBs are very tactically inspired, but the problem is when you're making survival and wilderness blades with tactical um, lineage first, you end up leaning into a lot of things that are not very um, suitable or very useful for outdoor tasks. So just taking these two into account, and this actually, this demo here is a little bit smaller than the already pretty small Bushcrafter, so you're going to have to take that into account as well for usability but in addition to that one thing i've noticed is that they tend to run hfb tends to run a lot of their blades very thin and that tends to end up leading to two big problems when it comes to outdoor blades first off when it comes to thinness that overall impacts the handle thickness and this is something that i find with a lot of blades actually pretty much outside of their calf um, that honestly most of these blades feel very thin in the hand and i don't really love that as you guys can see here what i'm talking about that not only is the blade stock much thinner on this demo than the bushcrafter but that handle is noticeably thinner and less contoured now you do have these kind of uh, grooves in the handle that do help with traction but honestly having a really good palm swell means a lot especially when you're holding a blade for prolonged periods of time now that is one disadvantage of the thinner blade stock the other is when it comes down to doing more industrial tasks things like um, batoning are going to be far harder to do with a thinner blade stock because that thinner blade stock is going to be less prone to really pushing or separating wood when you're batoning it so those are kind of a couple criticisms of common wilderness tasks that something like these hfbs will repetitively not do very well and as you can see with this crow scout too it is even thinner and uh, i believe this crow scout's around an eighth of an inch thick which is a little thin for me and just to put this into perspective you know the bushcrafter is um 5 30 seconds pretty much everything else is closer to 3 16 this is a 3 16 inch um SC6 and then we have moving over to I think this guy is also about 3 16 if not closer to a quarter inch thick um, and then of course we have the near quarter inch thick Bravo 1 and then the near quarter inch thick a1 and so ultimately when it comes down to it you'll see that a lot of these blades are going to be thicker and there is intention behind that it's to make wilderness tasks specific wilderness tasks like batoning and industrial applications much easier to do now one disadvantage i have with these hfbs is that even though you are um, getting a thinner blade stock you're still paying um, just as much as something like a Bark River, if not more. Um, and that's why, like I said, these are genuinely comparable listings of blades. Like these are blades that would run in similar price ranges. So moving on, um, I will say, like I said, one of my more favorited uh, designs of theirs is the Cav or the Cavener. And uh, this guy, I think, is probably the most well suited to wilderness use. However, I will say, I do think that the handle is a little bit too long for the blade profile. This is one that, I don't know, just stands out really odd to me. And uh, I don't really quite love the overall. Like, I do, I, from an ergonomic standpoint it feels comfortable but i do wish there was more blade here and once again too i think it's also worth noting they do certain types of coatings and for me i don't know what to say exactly i i think that these coatings these what we would traditionally consider a black wash which is some type of black oxide finish with a stone wash over it and so that's how you kind of form this black wash finish and they look very aesthetically pleasing especially with this uh, like millwork on the back and you know in different areas but ultimately they are very susceptible to rust because 
So ultimately that's how black wash finishes are created. Now next they have these Cerakotes and for me these Cerakotes just feel very weird. I've had multiple Cerakotes of course on firearms and on other knives actually as well and these I just I don't know they are plenty durable but they seem to have a very weird kind of like traction to them and once again when you have uh, this type of traction and don't mind some of the like grime on here I mean genuinely like the actual uh, coating itself is pretty tacky and when you have that it ends up creating a lot of binding in hard use types of situations so when you're doing things like batoning that's adding extra friction instead of eliminating friction and that's why on a lot of your um, survival and wilderness knives you'll see satin coatings and the reason why satin is so heavily used is because one it's naturally pretty corrosion resistant it doesn't really um, rough up the surface of the steel so it naturally actually is kind of almost a polish so that prevents rust and then of course when you polish that steel as you guys can see by a light polish on this blade um, you know it, it's going to make going through objects cutting through objects or even batoning through them far easier because there's no traction or, or there's no um, you know like grip created by a coating and so you'll see basically on all of my you know survival knives that they really some of my and you'll see basically on most of my survival knives, there's no coating. It's pretty much all satin on these three guys. Now, in fairness, there is the good old SC truck bed liner coating on here. And on this blade, I will say it does tend to make a little bit more sense because 1095 is just a more rust prone steel. So in certain applications, it does make sense to have a more industrial coating, but uh, for the most part, yeah, it doesn't really need to be there. And you'll even see this is a KG gun coat on the Chris Reeve Knives Pacific. And it's, I think, if I was gonna go for a coating, what I would optimally aim for, because it's very, very, um, it's very smooth and there's not much traction or friction being produced by this coating. That being said too, I will say coatings do only go so far. Even this KG gun coat you can see does show quite a bit of wear around this area where I've heavily batoned this knife. And to be honest, this knife has seen a ton of action. But um, yeah, so coatings really only get you so far anyways. But as it stands, I really do prefer most of my knives to be uncoated for the wilderness, even if they are in a more um, high carbon steel like A2. It's just because they are honestly more corrosion resistant when they're in a highly polished state and they honestly tend to fare better and work. Um, they tend to work as they should. So that's another thing I should say about them. Now, lastly, I want to note is sheaths. Now, sheaths are always going to be a little bit um, controversial, but one thing that I've consistently noticed with the sheaths on all of my um, on my HFB and the HFB knives that I've received here is that the quality control in these just seem a little bit off. Now, I will say they do felt line their Kydex sheaths, which is an interesting point. I think that is neat, but I really don't like it. And honestly, I think the felt adds, especially when combined with the fact that you're dealing with, you know, coated blades, you have this extra friction and there's just a lot of friction when it comes to the actual um, sheath. And then on top of that too, the fitment of these sheaths just is never, has never been there. And what I mean by this is that there is a good amount of like friction to these, like they're not going to just pop out of here, but there's no like Kydex lock into these sheaths and so essentially there's no like um, click and so I guess I'll show um, with something like this I do realize this one's just a thermoplastic so it's not a technical kydex but I do have kydex sheaths that do have this feature but you'll notice that there's like a definitive click to them when you know that the knife is locked in there. These sheaths don't seem to have that present. In addition to that too, you'll notice that these sheaths are very just rough. Like there's some sharp kydex still right here. And uh, yeah, these sheaths just feel very unfinished. And normally I wouldn't really care about a sheath being particularly unfinished or kind of left rough around the edges. But these knives are honestly very expensive and more 
expensive than these two Bark Rivers, um, more expensive than this Falkneven A1. Honestly, more in line with the price of the Chris Reeve Knives Pacific and knives like the Survive series of knives. And so when you see these blades that, you know, have very, um, very rough sheets and you know, just kind of overall weird um, fit and finish, kind of lack of refinement things. It just really makes you unmotivated to want to use these blades or really moreover purchase them. And so what I will say is that I think like in the end, if you've bought a half face blades knife, whether it's something like the Crow Scout, the Cav, the, um, the Cav or any of their others like the Extremis Mark 1, you know, they're not bad blades and I guess kind of from a level of, you know, ownership, like if you own one, then great. Uh, I wouldn't say go out and sell it, but this company relies very heavily on really good pictures on Instagram and ironically you can't even tag their Instagram so if you want to help promote their blades you can't do that but uh, moreover they use very nice looking pictures and good photography to market products that I don't think really are up to the cost that they are trying to get out of their consumers and so ultimately I would say that even though these are nice and good products for the most part, they lack a lot of refinement that I think other knife companies like Bark River Knives, Chris Reeve Knives, Falkneven, Essie, Essie Knives uh, just have on lock. And I mean, putting these two like toe to toe, uh, this Bark River Bravo one versus this uh, Crow Scout, by half face blades, you can kind of see like, this is just a very oversized lanyard loop and I don't really know why it needs to be that way. The very thin nature of it makes it very, um, not confidence inspiring for wilderness use. And overall, uh, you know, just the handle ergonomics I don't really think are there. Like you'll see that ultimately this is a textured micarta, but it, if it's if it wasn't for this texturing, this is like flat slabbed micarta. Whereas I, I think like honestly one of the biggest things I love about Bark River is that they really have honed in super well on ergonomics and palm swells. And when you look at these two side by side, and I'm probably not doing the best job here, try to do a better job at showing these handles off, you know, you'll see that um, really when it comes down to it, you know, this HFB is a flat slab micarta, whereas this has a very noticeable, very nice palm swell. And once again, it's one thing to talk about in a video, but it's totally noticeable in person or when you handle these knives, how much more hand filling this feels as opposed to realistically any of these HFB blades. I mean, even this guy right here, the, the Kavner is just a flat slab handle with some contouring, you know, around it. And once again, that kind of makes it feel good but at the same time too there could be a lot more done to the handle to make it a lot more ergonomically um, superior and you'll even notice with basically all of these you know more higher end or upper echelon kind of survival and wilderness blades they are featuring a noticeable handle uh, swell that feels really natural in multiple positions whether choked back choked up or just in a standard position and uh, you know like even this guy has a slight palm swell. You can kind of notice, especially as it tapers down towards where your pinky and ring finger would land. And so ultimately, you know, these are knives that have been in the industry for a long time, are very well proven. And I don't think the half face blades is quite there. I think they're making blades that look very hyped up and very cool and certainly do function just fine, but don't really actually bring to bear what I would expect for the money that they want to get out of their knives. Also too, I think they try to put a lot more emphasis on things that look cool, such as these like milling patterns on the spine and you know, like around the blade as a whole. Whereas it's like, you know, those things do look really cool, but at the end of the day, if we're wanting like a military tactical kind of uh, 
blade for you know just general purpose like this bravo one has no frills but it really gets the job done like this is a knife that was from the ground up designed by the marine uh, force recon unit and uh, it works really well so anyways that's kind of my perspective of half face blades and why i don't think that they are the future of survival knives anyways guys as always god bless and